Hello, I'm Craig Barton and welcome to this Tips for Teachers video. Now I'm going to be honest with you, the next couple of minutes are going to be slightly painful for me because I'm going to have to admit yet another of my many mistakes as a teacher. So let's imagine that you're my lovely students and my job is to try and explain to you the concept of a triangle. Now if you were unlucky enough to be taught by me early on in my career, then no doubt I would have started with a definition, because I thought that was the best way to understand something. But the problem, of course, with definitions is that often you, have, you end up having to define terms within the definition to understand the definition itself. So to understand what on earth this is banging on about, you've got to know what on earth a plain figure is, what straight means and what sides mean. Whenever you're defining a definition, it's not looking good for students understanding it. So fairly quickly, I realised that wasn't the best starting point. But where I moved to wasn't that much better, because what I then started with was a single example, and worse than that, it tended to be a fairly conventional example. Now, the problem with conventional examples is that students, it ends up narrowing students' understanding and experience of a concept, and they start making erroneous assumptions. So if you take this example of a triangle, if my example of a triangle is this, and my subsequent examples, when I start doing angles in a triangle and all that, all look like this as well, then students may start to assume that all triangles have horizontal bases, all triangles are isosceles or equilateral, and it becomes really problematic. So after a while, I realised that wasn't so great. So then I started trying to widen my students' appreciation and experience of, in this case, the concept of a triangle, with multiple examples. So this is a bit better because now we've got an orientation change, we've got a different type of triangle, a right angle triangle and so on. But of course this is still severely lacking. Because what, what hit me, and it took about 10 years for this to hit me, was that to truly understand something, it's not enough just to understand what it is, you've got to also understand what it isn't. And hence of course the power of non-examples. So after about 10 years of messing this up, I started to introduce examples of something that is and something that isn't. And this was certainly better, but I still think we can improve upon this. So when I'm trying to explain a concept to students now, I have three principles that I try to adhere to. So the first is, as we've just discussed there, I try and sequence a mixture of examples and non-examples. But I also do two other things. So the first is I include boundary examples, examples right at the concept, right at the boundary of where that concept is or that concept isn't. I'll show you an example of that in a second. But the third thing I do is perhaps the most interesting, and that is I try and make consecutive examples related so students can attend to the critical feature. Now let me try and demonstrate this with a sequence of examples on triangles. And then I'll also do it for another mathematical sequence. But what I'm interested, of course, if you're not a maths teacher, is could you do something similar for your subject? And what would you need to change to make this work? So let's have a look at triangles. Let's imagine you're my students. This is what it would go like. You'd ideally have mini whiteboards in front of you. And I'd start with a conventional example like this, something that you're pretty familiar with. I tend to start with an example versus a non-example, just to give kind of that early sense of success. So I'd put something like that up on the board and I would state very proudly, and I'd write it down as well, this is a triangle. And then what I'd do is I'd show you a second example and I would prompt you to pause and silently look at that and consider what's changed and what's stayed the same. Now, early on when I'm teaching this process to my students, I may then kind of go into the crowd, Ben, what have you noticed then? Ben may say, ah, the orientation's changed at this triangle, it's flipped over, something like that. But hopefully soon students will automate this routine, so I won't need to prompt them to do that. And then what I'd state, once students have attended to the critical feature that's changed, I would state that this is still a triangle. And then I'd pause again to get students to reflect on that. What have they learned there about what it takes to be a triangle? Well, hopefully they've learned that the orientation doesn't matter. Whiz that around wherever you want, you've still got yourself a triangle. All right, so now what I'm going to do is this. So I'd show my students that image and I'd pause. And that will be their cue to reflect what's changed and what's stayed the same. And then I would then reveal this is not a triangle. And then pause again. And that pause, that second pause is so important because that's the prompt, the cue for students to try and explain what's happened. What critical features changed 
and what impact has that had on the concept? So the critical feature between one and two didn't change. It was still a triangle. When the critical feature between two and three changed, it did change whether it fit inside the family of, of being a triangle. And then I'd carry on. So, okay, what critical features change now? Well, now we've no longer got straight sides, we've got curved sides. What's happened there? Still not a triangle. So each time I'm showing an image, pausing so students can reflect on what's changed and what's not changed, then revealing the answer of whether it fits into the family of the concept or not, and then pausing again to get, give students an opportunity to see if they can reconcile what's happened. I'll show you a few more. So I'll change the orientation, that's a triangle. Now what am I gonna do? Well, I'm gonna make sure I've got both concave and convex curved lines, just to try and cover the, the, the full scope of, um, of the domain of this. No, that's not a triangle. Then I'll do something like this. So again, just to recap, I'll show students that. I'll get them to pause and think what's changed. Well, now the lines are straight, but wait a minute, we now seem to have a little kind of bend in this. Is that a triangle or not? Once, once they've reflected, I'll reveal. No, nope, this is not a triangle, then pause again. Now at any stage, I'm free to go into the crowd. If I sense students are confused, a lack of understanding, I can just stop things and say, okay, let's focus on question seven. Mirren, what did you notice about question seven? Oh, fantastic, it's got four sides. Okay, what does that tell you about a triangle? Everybody write it down in your mini whiteboards. So I'm free to do that at any stage or I can just let this sequence run. And, and I'll end with a triangle that's a little bit weird, a non-conventional triangle, and that is a triangle. Now, how do I wrap up this process? This only takes a couple of minutes. Well, at the end of it, my two favorite things to do to students are to say, okay, the first thing I want you to do on your mini whiteboards is draw an example of a triangle that someone might think was not a triangle. And then secondly, draw a non-example of a triangle that someone might think is a triangle. So what I'm trying to do there is really assess students' understanding of this concept, not by saying draw me something that's obviously a triangle and obviously not, because you just draw you know, an equilateral triangle in a circle there. I want them to go right to the boundary. And then I can have a look at their mini whiteboards when they hold them up, they can swap with each other, and I can get a real sense of their understanding of a concept. So that's one way of doing it. Um, another example might be something like this. I wanted to do one that's non-visual. So let's take an expression. So again, imagine you're my students and I'm trying to teach you what it takes to be an expression. So I'll start with this, I'll show you five, and I'll say that's not an expression. Then I'll say, right, okay, what have I done there? Just pause, what's changed and what's stayed the same? So in students' heads, it's gone from a number to a letter. I'll then reveal, still not an expression. Okay, all right. What am I gonna do next? I'm gonna put those two things together. So notice I'm not choosing examples from random here, they're always related, that's important. So students can observe what's changed and then observe the impact. Okay, five plus X, pause. That is an expression. Okay, pause again. So students have an opportunity to start building this picture of what it takes to be an expression. Then I do this. So students may be thinking after question three, okay, right, so if you've got a number and a letter and an operation, you've got an expression. But when they see this, no, that's not an expression. Now, if they're confused at that point, I'll probably say to them, look, okay, stick with it. Let me show you a few more, then we'll have a discussion about it because I know what's coming. I want to build this up for students. Okay, now let's do a division. Is that an expression? Hmm, multiplication wasn't, maybe division isn't either. Yeah, okay, that's not an expression. So what have I got to do next? Of course, I've got to do subtraction. That is an expression. So at the end of that run there, students may have a fairly decent idea of what it takes to be an expression. But here's the key thing. There are still gaps in their knowledge at that point. Gaps that I can help them plug by carefully varying what comes next. So again, it's a worthwhile um, exercise here, particularly if you're a maths teacher, of just pausing here and thinking, what have students learned here, but what's still lacking? What are some of the expressions that they could be presented with that they may miscategorize? So let me show you where I went with this. Firstly, I realized that I didn't have any negative variables here. So I just wanted to make a negative variable. So just flip six around, still an expression. But then of course, I've used X all the time. I think maths teachers are often guilty of that. I don't want kids thinking expressions always involve X. So let's chuck a Y in there. Have I messed things up now? Nah, still in the family of expressions. Things are looking good. Okay, what happens next? Everything's been linear so far. Let's square it. Still an expression? Yeah, still an expression. Okay, so every, with each one of these, students' understanding is deepening and deepening as their experience widens. What happens next? Well, I noticed here, I always had a single variable. Let's chuck a P in. Does that mess things up? Because without that example, students may leave thinking expressions only ever have one letter in there. 
Now, nah, still got an expression there. Now, I thought this was important as well. Every single one of these that's been an expression has a number involved. So I don't want students making that erroneous assumption, so let's chuck that in as well. And then finally, of course, let's chuck an equals at the end. We've broken it, no longer an, no longer an expression. So going through that process, again, only takes a few minutes. It's pause when students see an example to see what's changed and what's stayed the same, and then pause after the reveal of whether it fits into the family or not so they can try and reconcile what's happened. And then the final challenge at the end, an example of an expression that someone might think is not, and not an example of an expression that someone might think is, to push their understanding to the limits. So just to recap there, they're my three principles I use when I'm trying to explain a concept to students. A mixture of examples and non-examples, boundary examples, but then also making the examples related to each other so students' attention can focus on the critical feature. Now that's just a couple of examples from maths. If you're a non-maths teacher watching, is that useful at all? Do you do something similar for that? Could you make that work? What would you need to change to make it work? Let me know. Um, if you found that in any way useful, I'd be so grateful if you could like the video and subscribe to the Tips for Teachers YouTube channel. It really does make a difference. And finally, visit tipsforteachers.co.uk for more tips like this. Thanks so much for watching.